The story of the Shumash Indians is one of great resilience. Hundreds of years ago, Shumash tribes utilized resources from both land and sea along a 200-mile stretch of California coastline. The establishment of Spanish missions in the late 1700s began a tumultuous period where the Shumash population dropped from 22,000 to 2,800. Decades of struggle followed. But the survivors never relented. Seven years after opening its first gaming facility, the Santa Inez Band of Shumash Indians started construction on a state-of-the-art casino and resort designed to elegantly blend with the surrounding Santa Inez Valley land their ancestors once occupied. The success of the Shumash Casino Resort has put tribal members on the path to economic self-sufficiency for current and future generations. Today, you'll hear stories from a 9,000-year history rich with culture, with giving, and with pride stories of great achievement, of past and present adversity, of the fight to revive a culture pushed to the brink of extinction. Stories of Shumash Life. In this edition of Shumash Life, a recent economic impact study shows just how positive the Santa Inez Shumash's impact has been on the local economy. The time and dedication required to resurrect a language has resulted in the rebirth of the tribe's native language, Samala. The tribe's long-term community partnership with the Santa Barbara Zoo has resulted in projects like the recently completed Discovery Pavilion. But first, the waiting is over, and the Santa Inez Band is ready to move forward on creating its Shumash Museum and Cultural Center. The Santa Inez Band of Shumash Indians waited for nearly 14 years for its 6.9 acres of land to be placed into federal trust. Once it was, the tribe took the first step toward building its long-awaited Shumash Museum and Cultural Center by hiring an architect. But not just any architect. The tribe hired John Paul Jones, a renowned architect whose firm, Jones & Jones, has completed more than 650 projects in the Americas, Asia, Europe, Australia, and Africa. Among those projects are many in Indian country. When introducing John Paul Jones to the community at a special reception this past fall, Tribal Chairman Vincent Armenta told the crowd, who better to help us create an incredible museum than an individual who was a lead designer for the National Museum of the American Indian in Washington, D.C.? And who better to help us create a museum of our dreams than an individual who was recently awarded a National Humanities Award by President Obama? John Paul Jones is a man who has accomplished much in his distinguished 40-year career as an architect. The son of a Welsh-American father and a Choctaw Cherokee mother, he was schooled by his mother's family in their tribe's thought and life ways while growing up in rural Oklahoma. His design philosophy emerged from his native ancestors, centering around four worlds. The first is the natural world. Everybody says, oh, native people are attached to the natural world, you know, but they are. They know the dirt, they know the plants, they know the seasons, the stars. They know the solstice and the equinoxes and they led a sustainable life. So all of that is part of the natural world. The second is the animal world. John Paul takes into consideration that the earth is something we share with the animals. The third is the spirit world. Now, it's not church. It's really the spirit of the community, the spirits of the place out there, those rocks. They all have a spirit, and it's finding that and listening to people talk about that and then using it in the design. The final world is the most important to John Paul. It's the human world that we live in, and the key thing in all of that is the transfer of knowledge. We do that through schools, but it also is through our families and the ancient knowledge from uh, Native people living here a long, long, long time. A lot of it is learned out walking around in a garden or sitting with your granddaughter or grandson and telling the stories. And so as architects, we try to provide design that really reinforce those four worlds. It was immediately clear that the tribe made the right decision in hiring John Paul Jones and his firm. When we had our meeting yesterday, really tells me that we are heading the right direction to listen to how he gets to the point of actually building the building. It was extremely important. So I think we're all going to be happy with the project. And it's something I think, you know, the whole valley is going to enjoy. As John Paul explains it, designing a museum is a complex series of moves. And it's like the fingers in a hand. And uh, 
What it is is that you start a lot of different things at the same time. And it's not a straight linear process. We start looking at the site and trying to understand what the site's all about. And then we start trying to do initial work with uh, understanding the culture as best we can. And then we try to spend some time on the uh, program, like how many square feet are there inside and outside and all that stuff. So we start about four or five things at once, and then we hang the design on those critical things. And then it really represents uh, the people that we're working for. When all is said and done, the Shumash Museum and Cultural Center will be a special place that will allow the tribe to share its rich cultural heritage with the public. We're very blessed that we're able to have him uh, design our building. He's going to take the time to understand us and how our people are before he even starts penciling on a paper. I, I really like um, I like the folks that we've met. I just that, that has a lot to uh, do with us being able to accomplish something really special and successful is the openness and the sharing that we feel from the Chumash people. And I'm sure it's gonna be the same thing with the community around here too. The, you know, there, some might be a little worried what's gonna happen, but um, that's the way it was in Washington, D.C. when we were doing the Smithsonian National Museum. They were worried that, what are the Indians gonna do in the mall in Washington, D.C.? And after a few years, everybody started to calm down, and now they just really love it, what was done. So I think we'll be successful here. The Chumash have a lot to share, a lot of things they've learned over thousands of years. With the help of John Paul Jones, the tribe is well on its way to making its dream a reality. The findings of a recent economic impact study show what we've known all along. The Santa Inez Chumash tribe has a significant positive impact on the local economy. In early 2014, Beacon Economics, one of California's leading economic consulting firms, published an analysis of the economic and social impacts of tribal gaming and other operations in California. The analysis determined that tribal gaming operations generated an estimated $8 billion in revenues for California businesses and supported more than 56,000 jobs statewide. More recently, Beacon Economics completed an economic impact study of the Santa Inez Band of Chumash Indians. There was no doubt that the Santa Inez Chumash tribe has made a positive impact on the local economy. But Beacon Economics report not only confirms the sizable impact of gaming and non-gaming operations on the local and state economy, but also shows the tribe's significant impact on the health of the local community through investments in charitable organizations and social services. Jordan Levine, economist and director of economic research at Beacon Economics, discussed specifics of the study. The Chumash tribe generates a significant economic impact across Santa Barbara County as well as throughout the rest of the state, almost $300 million a year in annual output, as well as a little over 2,600 jobs throughout the county and throughout the rest of the state. Most of the impact has been concentrated right there in the local economy, though. The most surprising was just how much of the impact was formed of these secondary impacts. So not just the spending done by Chumash themselves, but how that spending then rippled through and created almost an equal impact as what the tribe themselves actually supported. About 150 or so million is directly spent by the Chumash tribe themselves. However, the other half, the second half of the impact is really impacts that are generated outside of the tribal operation. So these are jobs created at the downstream suppliers, as well as just jobs created in the general economy as folks go out and earn wages associated with the output at Chumash or their casino vendors, and then spent that money back into the local economy by you know, paying rent, buying cars, taking their families out to eat. So the impact really does expand much beyond the walls of just Chumash themselves and really is a positive impact for businesses all across Santa Barbara County. Beacon Economics strives to make their analyses about more than just numbers. As such, their report on the Santa Inez Band of Chumash Indians shows the tribe's economic impact on the community in a much broader context. Yes, we do talk about the economic impacts, and we do use multiplier analysis, but we build on to that a little bit more. We talk about the kind of jobs that are being created, the people who are getting those jobs. You think about your typical sort of gaming operation, those are good jobs for people who a lot of times don't have access to good jobs. And we try to bring that up in the context of the economic analysis. 
We do a fiscal analysis. What does it mean for local governments? How does this influence the budgets that they use to keep the roads fixed and keep the place safe? So yet again, try to create a picture I think one of the important points that we found was this isn't something that's just accruing as benefits to the tribe themselves. It's the vast majority of folks who are benefiting from this were, were the non-tribal members or just the broader Santa Barbara County economy in general. The Shumash's contributions to the local community also play a large role in the tribe's impact. Probably the, the most important part of our analysis is what we call the, the social impact. The Indian gaming casinos have been very active in terms of charity. They work with local governments to the point where they actually will fund the police departments. They give back. And from that perspective, we want to highlight that as well. And you're not going to capture that in a multiplier analysis. So these impacts have all three of those. We got the social, we got the economic, we got the fiscal, and you create a report that tells you a complete story. The Santa Inez Band of Shumash Indians was pleased with the findings of the study, which put the tribe's impact on the local economy into perspective. There's been a tremendous positive impact within our community through the creations of jobs, through our donations, uh, through the use of local vendors, which has brought hundreds of millions of dollars back into our community. We are also starting a casino expansion project, which will bring hundreds of jobs to the community, both during and after construction. With its various business enterprises, the Santa Inez Band of Shumash Indians will continue to contribute to the local economic engine. For the past decade, the tribe has been on a mission to resurrect its native language. Tribal members are learning their language, one Somala phrase at a time. It has been said that a journey of a thousand miles must begin with a single step. The Santa Inez Band of Shumash Indians took that single step more than a decade ago when the tribe began the process of resurrecting its native language, known as Somala. Tribal members live and breathe their culture every day and incorporate the ways of their ancestors into their lives. But what they didn't have was their language. The last elder who spoke the Somala language had passed away in the mid-1960s. Although we had quite a few cultural programs going, we knew there was something that was missing, and that was our language. Research into the Somala language led the tribe to Dr. Richard Applegate, a linguist who had studied the tribe's language more than four decades ago when he was a graduate student at UC Berkeley. He worked with boxes of original notes on the Somala language from John Peabody Harrington, a linguist and ethnologist who specialized in the native people of California. I would come across something like um, Skuthahuchu, and Harrington would just say, he sees the dog. And I didn't know which part meant dog, I didn't know which part meant sees or anything about it. But a while later I might see something like Siwanahuchu, the dog is barking, and I thought, aha, the Huchu part must mean dog. And so it was little by little like that that I figured out the language. Working with Dr. Applegate, one of the first tasks the tribe undertook was creating a language dictionary, complete with phrases, pronunciation guides, and a history of the tribe's language. The end result of the multi-year project was a 600-plus page comprehensive dictionary. Soon after, the general council voted unanimously to create a culture and language department including an apprenticeship program to develop teachers for Somala language classes. The apprenticeship program began um, working under Dr. Richard Applegate. He went through and he developed curriculum for us to learn this language. We couldn't have done this without him. We still have five of those original apprentices, which is fabulous. We are a family now. The language is built in us. And now we're, we are teachers. At our learning center here, based on the reservation, we have after-school programs for children of any age that go down and use the learning center facilities. In 2009, the Santa Ynez Band of Shumash Indians was instrumental in the passage of Assembly Bill 544, the Native Languages Credential Bill. As a result, the tribe's native language can now be taught in local schools. I think the most important way that we've advanced or helped advance native languages in California is through the uh, introduction of AB 544, which our tribe supported tremendously. The tribe has partnered with the Family School in Santa Ynez to make it the first local school to offer Somala language classes. We were just excited to have this partnership with the uh, Santa Ynez Band of Chumash Indians. 
the reception of the students to learning the language has been remarkable. Uh, within the first two weeks, parents were coming and saying, oh, we're learning the Somali language, you know, their children are getting in the car uh, and excited at the end of the day and teaching them new words in Somala. Uh, and uh, students were really raving about the program. We get to go beyond the textbook. In fact, we don't even bring the textbook into the study of the indigenous people of this area. And we have it existing right here with our teachers and with the language. So it's sort of a chain. It started off with Maria Solares, working with J.P. Harrington, going to Dr. Applegate, and now actually coming to our people. Keeping the language alive is very important to our tribe to keep it flowing for our next generations, to teach our children and other children the language. It is part of who we are. The tribe's powerful language program continues to reach tribal members, their children, and the community. In a recurring segment featuring the Santa Inez Chumash Indians Foundation, we take a look at the tribe's long-term partnership with the Santa Barbara Zoo. In a move that upholds its long-standing tradition of giving back to the community, the Santa Ines Band of Chumash Indians Foundation made a multi-year commitment to the Santa Barbara Zoo, specifically for its work with the California Condor and for construction of the zoo's educational facility, the Discovery Pavilion. Located on 30 acres of lush botanic gardens overlooking the Pacific Ocean and Santa Ynez Mountains, the Santa Barbara Zoo is home to 146 species of mammals, reptiles, birds, and insects. Nearly 500,000 guests visit the zoo each year, where more than 500 animals are exhibited in open, naturalistic habitats, including one of the world's rarest bird species, the California condor. Back in 2002, the zoo was invited to become part of the California condor recovery effort. And when that happened, going to the Chumash seemed like such a natural fit, simply because condors are an important part uh, of Native American history. And we wanted to not only have condors here to tell the story about conservation, but we really wanted to be able to tell more of a story about Native American cultures and the people who lived here. With the tribe's involvement, the California Condor exhibit expanded to become California Trails, a $7.5 million exhibit complex featuring some of the most endangered species in the Golden State. At the Condor exhibit, traditional Shumash flute music plays in the background. The tribe also performed a ceremonial blessing of the grounds attended by the tribal council. It really has been a, a great showcase that brings together a conservation message, as well as a message about some of the, the more spiritual and social dimensions to, to the, the, the way the condors fit into the history of this area. In addition to helping with the zoo's condor exhibit, the Santa Inez Band of Chumash Indians Foundation also helped with the Discovery Pavilion, a brand new education facility that opened earlier in 2014. The Discovery Pavilion really plays uh, numerous roles within the zoo. Uh, the whole project's about 9,500 square feet, but what it does is it provides some classrooms and expands our ability to, to do much more with our educational programming. So we can reach more students in classes, more families, and then evening programs so we can reach adult audiences. Uh, it also gave us a brand new animal kitchen that's like an exhibit. Guests can come and actually see the preparation of the diets, they can see our nutrition team at work, and really have a chance to see how important animal nutrition is and the level of care taken in preparing the animal diets. It's been a great contributor to our operations and to all those people that invested in it, such as the foundation. Uh, you know, we're, we're eternally grateful for that. Unlike most zoos, which are publicly funded municipal operations supported by tax dollars, the Santa Barbara Zoo depends on the support of the community for operations. As a private, non-profit organization, the Santa Barbara Zoo relies on revenues generated from ticket sales, memberships, concessions, education programs, private events, and donations from generous individuals and organizations. The Chumash Foundation and the zoo have had a long partnership. It's just been great getting to know everyone there and to have their support of so much that we're doing here 
from our exhibits to education and our, our new education facility, the Discovery Pavilion. What's neat about the Shumash Foundation is that they really are interested in what we're doing. Uh, they want to know that our conservation and our education programs are strong, so I, I love that about working with them. The relationship with the foundation has really been wonderful because it's worked both ways. We have enjoyed uh, the opportunity to get to know people uh, at the foundation, on the council, and, and see them participate in activities with the zoo. The tribe's community partnership with the Santa Barbara Zoo is just one of the many ways the Shumash give back to the community. Through its foundation, the tribe has contributed more than $18 million to date. Thank you for watching this winter 2014 edition of Shumash Life. See past segments at youtube.com forward slash Shumash Life or Cox On Demand Channel 1892 in Santa Barbara County.